Last week, we've been talking about prescriptive ethics. So these are ways to be asked the question. Jennifer says, I don't know what the right thing to do is. That depends on which prescriptive ethics you choose. You could be an ethical egoist. Joy said she's an ethical egoist. She'd say, Jennifer, the right thing to do is what makes you the most happiest. What's best for you? That's an ethical egoist. And Bonnie comes along. She's a... Did you say, what did you say? She, she's a pessimist. <laughs> he goes, well, I, that's a whole other study on pessimism. That's next level prescriptive ethics. <laughs> and Bonnie comes along and says, Why, who cares? I mean, you know, I'd give up if I were you. That's why we're going to fail anyway. She's a deontologist. And she says, well, the right thing to do, Jennifer, is the thing that which moral duties you should be doing. Do the moral duty you should. And Tumor says, which moral duty is that? She said, well, here's mine. Here's why. I choose. These are my moral duties. And I put them in this order, the most important. And then um, comes Brad Keen. No, no, no. The right thing to do is what has the best consequences. I'm a consequentialist. And okay, your consequence for you, for other people, for what? Let's pretend for a second. She goes, you know what? I'm a utilitarian kind of consequence. I think what's best for the most amount of people is what's best. Um, here comes Jack. Jack goes, no, no, no. The right thing to do is obviously what builds up your character. Because the whole goal in life is to have a virtue. And you say, which virtues? And you go, well, here are these virtues and here's why. So in the moment, the right thing to do is to build virtue up. So in a nutshell, those are the three things, the biggest systems there are. And then we talked about there are various Christian virtues all through the New Testament. And then we, at the, I'm on the handout here. I've got more in the back there, but top of, bottom page three, top page four. So Christians list all kinds of virtues because of the New Testament. And then, of course, I said last time we wrapped up on this, in the ancient world, people like Plato, Aristotle, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, they all basically said the same thing. There are four biggies, four pillars, four cardinal virtues, they call them. Wisdom, of course. They, we might translate that temperance, or prudence, rather, wisdom, and encourage, and justice, and self-control. The old way of saying self-control is temperance, but those are the four biggies. Wisdom, courage, justice, and self-control. Then Christians, for a long time, because of texts like 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and Paul says this a few things, said, what are the greatest? Faith, hope, and love. If you remember your 1 Corinthians 13, 13, faith, hope, and love. And so those become cardinal virtues for a lot of Christians. And I'm just giving a big overview here. So you might say faith slash trust is intellectual assent. I believe something to be true. And also an emotional or psychological belief. It's both and. That's cardinal virtue that I need to, whatever the right choice is, what builds up my faith in the Lord Jesus. And then hope. I used to translate more manifest to joy. I'm going a little different direction with that now, but hope, trusting in what we know to be true, regardless of our changing emotions. That's loosely based on C.S. Lewis, who said, faith is holding on to what we know to be true, regardless of our changing moods. But I think it's more like hope. That is, I, I hope something's going to happen, even though I might not see it all the time or feel it. And of course, love, the self-giving act of caring for and serving others. We could spend time unpacking all these, but I think most people have a basic concept in Christianity. So some virtue ethicists say these are the cardinal virtues of Christianity, faith, hope, and love. And then other virtue ethicists, Christians come along and say, no, there's all kinds of things. And the New Testament in particularly, um, ariti, which is the, our Greek word for virtue, it's used very infrequently. In fact, it's only in 2 Peter 1, 3 to 5. So that's the only time in the New Testament that exact word is used. Um, some might say forgiveness should be a big cardinal issue, uh, virtue, not acting out punishment or demanding payment. Some say humility should be a ma major virtue in Christianity. That is, you might say being teachable. Uh, I'm I'm not independent of God. Um, everything is a gift from God. It's derivative. That's one idea, humility. Some say joy, thanksgiving, because Paul says, give thanks all in all things, cir circumstances. Thanksgiving is the proper response to what God has done. So Christian virtue ethicists give a bunch of different responses. To, and you could add other ones, right? What would be something that might stick out in your mind if you're thinking of various virtues in the New Testament? What, what might they be? Anything else you can think of?
Good. Huh? Sir. Yeah, you can say service, right? Mark ten forty five. I didn't come to serve, but to be uh, to be served, but to serve in my life as a ransom. Many, many. John thirteen, he washed the disciples' feet. So we say that by the example of Jesus, uh, to serve. That's right. Um, in Philippians two, Paul says he he took the mind of a slave, the form of a slave, so that as an example how we should treat each other. He says at the beginning of Philippians two, you could add service easily. Absolutely. Um, you might say being generous. You might say. Uh, being hospitable, you might go through the different gift of the, the gifts of the Spirit, Romans twelve or Corinthians twelve, and say, "So there's a bunch from which to choose." That's for sure. Um, yeah, a lot of them. And of course, the goal is: what's the point here? If you're a virtue ethicist, you would say, "That's how I know what the right thing to do is." Now, Jennifer might ask back to, uh, "Was it me or Jack? Or someone was the virtue ethicist? Maybe it was Jack." And um, and Jennifer says, "Great. So, which virtues?" And he might say. Well, there's some cardinal ones and some other biggies, but here's just 30 of them. Choose from them. And whatever you think of the moment builds up that character to be like that virtuous. That's the one you should do. And Jennifer might say, how do I know what's going to build up my character? And that starts a good conversation about character building and virtue ethics, right? So every, no matter what decision you make, you make it. And they all have follow-up questions and discussions, but that's why people make a living off of this stuff. They keep writing. <laughs> that's why they do. They keep writing books. Well, if that's true, what about this? And what, yeah. So at this point, remember, this is an intro to Christian morality and, and God. We're just in the big picture, believe it or not. <laughs> and we're talking about the major system. So there are four major systems one more time. Like I told you, it's on your handout. Ethical egoism, consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics in general. Most Christians historical, well, I don't know if any Christian who would, who would say that ethical egoism should not play. The idea of doing what's right is what's best for me by nature is against Jesus. So most rule that out, as I've already told you a few times. It's those other three where most Christians kind of sit down on and say, now that they decide which one it is. Now, I'm going to go through some biblical examples in a second, but any questions or comments about anything we've covered so far? Yes, ma'am. The individual always like a system of innate scavity. Good question. So can it? Does an individual always fall into one system, or can they use different systems? The answer is he, he, they can. I don't know of a person who only goes into one system. I don't know of one. So maybe they exist, but yeah. Uh, but in general, I think a person goes in and out of the different camps. I, I do think it, I know I do. I think in general people do. If you write books on this and articles, typically they will say, if I'm a blank ethicist, I'm going to approach her in this direction all the time. And they would say, I mean, to the benefit of the doubt, because they really believe it. That is, this is the right system. We humans should be deontologists. We humans should be blank. And so now I have not interviewed them or done research on whether or not they themselves live that way all the time in the real world at the grocery store and whatever. But at least academically, they can stick into one camp. So if you have a specialist in bioethics who's hired by a biological firm and they are doing stem cell research, the ethicist is going to have a particular view. Usually, I'm a blank ethicist, and so I'm going to come at it from this angle, and I'll help you make decisions based in this way. But what they do at home with their spouse, you know, yeah, good, good, good. But you might have different views. You might say, no, we should pick one and stick there. Okay. Um. I don't, but I know why I don't, and I'll go there in a second. But anything else? Any questions or comments? Okay, we're on page four of your handout, which you don't have it. There's more on the black table right there. Feel free to get some. Okay, what I've done now is the rest of it's not on the screen because it's on the handout. I wanted deliberately on this last part, you might have said, why not do the whole thing? But I wanted this last part particularly where you didn't feel like you had to take a lot of notes. I want you to really just... Let this sink in, as it were, as much as possible. And so, so reflections on using the Bible for morality, which, again, the handout's on the back table if you want to. So now I'm going to kind of slow down that. While the Bible doesn't always neatly fit into modern philosophical categories, it doesn't, we can identify passages that do resonate. They, they do fit, kind of fit. What I mean is, it's not that any biblical author is saying, I'm a deontologist, right? That's a modern way of talking about it. So deontological ethics, that's duty-based. Remember, rule-based, duty-based. Well, we see things that are like that all through the Bible. Here's just a few examples. 
and I gave some examples earlier. We're just going to slow down here. Was called the Decalogue, the Ten Words, translated Ten Commandments, unfortunately, but it's in two places. Um, it's in Deuteronomy and Exodus 20, but at Exodus 20, 1 through 17, we'll just choose that one. You know the ones. Um, don't murder, don't steal, don't take a man's brisket, basic Christian things. Um, so these are duties given to Moses right by God. Don't do this, do this. Honor your parents, obey the Sabbath. Those are duties. They're just simply rules that you're supposed to follow. Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through... Now, that's all, I could say a lot about that. Well, maybe it's worth... Yeah. I don't want to get bogged down either. Mm -hmm. Scholars disagree on the role of the Ten Commandments, but in general... <laughs> In general, thank you. It's safe to say that those are basic rules. I'm allergic to mint, and I always sneeze one time, with rare exception. And I have a mint in my mouth. And usually I sneeze early, and at the last bite, my nose is like, I haven't forgotten. I'm not forgotten. We're going to sneeze. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, or you say Sermon on the Plain, Luke chapter 6. Of course, Jesus lays out all kinds of things. Do not this, do not. I know you've heard it said, don't murder. But I say, if you have hatred in your heart, you've so forth. I say, I know, don't commit adultery. I'm saying, no name of lust. I know you've heard it said, uh, hate your enemy and love your neighbor. But I'm saying you love your enemies. So those sure sound like moral duties. There's a lot more to that, but I'm only talking about ethics right now. If we went back to the Old Testament, like in Micah 6, 8, this was fairly common in Judaism to take what they thought were the major ethical thrust of the entire Mosaic law and winnow it down. Rabbis did this for a long time, but it started in the Old Testament, like Micah 6, 8. Uh, o mortal, he's shown you what is good, no human. What does Yahweh require of you? To act justly or as righteously, that is according to the probate law. Love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So that's what Micah says, but that's just what Micah says. I've heard a lot of Christians say, that's what it's all about. Look, okay, I will say something about that, and I've said this before, too. It's amazing to me how Christians treat Micah 6, 8 and the so-called Ten Commandments as the basis of Christian morality. One is it tells me you're a deontologist. You might realize that that's the case. Two, it's striking that you use Old Testament texts as the basis of your Christian morality. That's very bizarre to me. That's a kind way of saying I fundamentally disagree with you. There's no reason to think Micah 6, 8 is the basis of Christian morality. That's what Micah said to ancient Jews, and it's his summary, but the Old Testament's full of things like this, summaries of ethical. So in the Christian worldview, those are they're authoritative without all applicable. For example, the, so, the Ten Commandments, it should be translated the, the Ten Words, Ten Sayings, but for example, one of them is to uh, obey the Sabbath, Shabbat, keep it holy. That is, holy means set aside God's time. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus never, of the, of, the, of the ten words or ten commandments, Jesus reinforces nine of them. The tenth one was Shabbat. He never said we have to keep Shabbat or Sabbath. And so we say, no, the ten commandments. But see, then it means you disagree with Jesus. I don't want to disagree with Jesus. I want to agree with Jesus. So which you, a person, a Christian, can still go to the Bible and say, the Bible's full of duties, moral duties. I need to pick and choose which ones. So that's a deontological ethicist would say that. Which rules, which duties? Well, the Bible's full of them. Which ones? And then you make your case. Then you make your, and I just try to make my case, which is to say, I think Jesus is the chief authority, so it winnows it down, you know. But everyone makes their case differently. I've heard all kinds of people. I've heard people make arguments about the tithe. The tithe is a moral duty for every Christian, no matter what. And they'll say, why? Well, because it's even before the Mosaic Law. It's even back to Abraham and Melchizedek and blah, blah, blah. And I don't find that persuasive in the least bit, but they'll make argument for it. And they'll say, because you have the moral duty, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. And that's deontological ethics. Why should you? Because there's a rule for it. There's, you have the moral duty. Uh, consequence, uh, any questions or comments about that before we move on? But we see this throughout the Bible. I just gave three quick examples. Paul gives moral duties all the time. Romans, right? Romans 12, 13, he says to, to honor the... Authority figures. They don't carry the sword in vain. He almost certainly is talking about paying taxes. Oh, he says to, to love those who persecute, but puts coals, burning coals on their head. I mean, 
There's tons of moral duties all through the New Testament. Do I know the play, The Crucible? Uh huh. The time period? All right, so in The Crucible, to prove they're not a witch, they had to say the Ten Commandments. And Julia's saying, but they had the New Testament like we have the New Testament. Why was that the measure of whether or not you're a witch? I agree. That's universe, it's ubiquitous in Christian literature and movies and songs and general belief that I mean, I've, I've heard this in every denomination and every church in which I work. I've heard people on the streets. I've seen all kinds of videos that go share evangelism. They go, do you know the Ten Commandments? Now, these are Christian evangelists. And they're, now, usually it's a setup it, to say, not a setup in a bad way, they're saying, do you know them? And they don't know, they're like one of them. But my the point is, the assumption is on the street with an average person, it's authoritative. Not the teaching of Jesus. They don't say, you know what Jesus said about lust. It's just with the Ten Commandments, they go, well, oh, I know I ought to. And so they're setting up, one is they're just ignorant, and so they have to tell them what they are. And two, have you ever stolen? Have you this, this, this? All right, because of that, are you guilty? Yes, I'm guilty. Then what do you do with that guilt? But it again, it assumes the average non-Christian, non-Jew on the street, pagan, already values them to a degree. And then that's fine. It's just, I, it's always staggering for a Christian to do that to me. Uh, it always treats them more authoritative than the teaching of Jesus. Bye. Yeah, like the Son of God is less important than, yeah. But there are people who argue that. I just don't, you can find it persuasive. I, I just don't. But bottom line, whether you find it persuasive or not, a deontologist will go to them as examples of rules you should follow. Yeah. Oh, great question. So if you just go for the words in red, do you dismiss everything else? If you don't know what she's talking about. There are certain Bibles called the Red Letter Bibles where they put everything Jesus said in red. And so people flip through and go, red, 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 there's Jesus. Oh, it's bleeding all over my tech. So, yeah, the Red Letter Bibles. Uh, so deontologists would give different answers to what you just said. They would, right? Some would say, no, no, it's all equally authoritative and applicable. And they'll give arguments for that. Or these are more than this, and they weigh them. My own, uh, most would deontologists would weigh them. Remember, I call the, the weight of rules, which ones are more important than the others of how we apply them. Uh, my view is that they are absolutely all equally authoritative. They are absolutely not equally applicable, period, ever. So by analogy, I give, um, when my kids were younger now, it'd still be true, I guess, but let's say they're both upstairs and they heard me yell something, come eat food. Well, they, birth, they both heard my voice. They thought they heard dad's voice. So they, hypothetically, they both paused because they heard a voice. They both thought the voice was equally authoritative to both, to both my children. But then they listen again and realize, oh, he said, come do blank. And Julia goes, oh, that's Hayden's. It's not equally applicable. The voice was authoritative for both. But now when they hear what the, me the content of the message, they realize it's not implied to me. That's exactly how I view the biblical text. So I perk up when God says something to Leviticus. I perk up because to me it's authoritative, but I perk up and listen to the content and to whom it's applying. And so in my view, um, which I've said in other studies, the number one most authoritative voice in the scripture is Jesus. Two, it's the early church. Three, it's the Old Testament. Just period. And then even then under that authorities figure, they're still not all equally applicable. So in Mark 10, when Jesus tells the rich man, to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. I don't think that applies to me. So his voice is authoritative. I pay real close attention to what he said to that rich man, but I don't think it applied that teaching, that commandment to go sell everything applies to me. Now, why is that? Because, and I can see I unpack all this because to me, applicability goes through stages. So, um, and when I do the study on how to read the Bible again, for all it's worth, I'll do this again. The first stage of applicability has to do with whether or not I fit the exact same scenario or context, a life situation that the, that the, uh, the audience did of that commandment. So, for example, it seems to me that when Romans 3, when Paul says, for all have sinned, fallen short of God's glory, I think I'm part of that all. But there are other times you use all, he doesn't mean all. It depends on the context and the literary context. And there, I think he means all humans. I think he means Jew and Gentile. And I would make the argument there because in Romans 1 and 2, I think he's setting up a universal human condition. So therefore, I think that applies to me a statement about humanity. 
So a commandment when Mark uh, 8, uh, 38, of course, when Jesus says, if anyone wants to be my disciple, follow me, must pick up his cross and I as well, himself and pick up his cross and follow me. And so I think when he says, anyone wants to be my disciple, I think that applies to me. Now, again, I would make an argument exegetically why I think that anyone applies to all humans, not just to people in his first century audience. And the main reason is because that's how the early church treated that teaching. They treated it as applicable all the time forever. So in that case, when he says, deny you will pick up a cross and follow me, I think that means I have the moral duty to pick up my cross and follow him. Okay. Then the second question is, what about when he says things that I don't fit the context exactly, that circumstance exactly? Then that con- that's uh, when that occurs, I try to pick up a principle from his teaching that I might be able to apply to my life. So, for example, back to Mark 10, when he says "Go to the rich man, go sell everything you have, give to the poor and follow me. Well, I am rich in the world stage. I'm very rich. Very, I have a house. I have two cars. I have a job. In the world stage, I'm in the top blank percentage of the world's population. In my country, I am not rich. So it's a relative term. And the first century when, Paul said, when Jesus said that to the guy, by relative terms, I'm, I'm convinced, based on historical evidence, that I would not fit the category of a rich man in the time period. I'd be like a low, well, they didn't really have middle class, but I'd be like a low, low, low middle class. I'd be richer than Jesus because he'd have a full-time job, but I know I'm a rich man. So instead, I think the rich man there, and I go on for a long time, I think the rich man there is told that because Jesus knows that rich man is using his wealth to be more important than the calling of Jesus. And because I think that's why he said it, Jesus, I think that's a principle that applies to me too. That is, whenever anything gets in the way of my allegiance to the kingdom of God, it's got to go. Now, I would prove that exegetically. He, t- he has a guy going to bury his family, and he says, let me, let me bury my father, then I come follow you. He might be on the funeral march. It also might mean, probably he means, wait for my dad to die, and I'll do exactly what Jewish sons are supposed to do, which is take care of the family business. And basically, it's like, when I'm retired, then I'll come do. Then it'll be convenient for me. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. It's a way of saying, your family responsibilities can't get in the way of me. That's another principle. Um, but you might say, David, but what if that is in your situation where you yourself do let your family obligations get in the way of the kingdom of God? Well, then he, that commandment follows to me exactly. So the first is our life circumstances. It applies immediately. It, it's applicable immediately. Two, if it doesn't amount to the exact life circumstances, I'm looking for a principle. But as I've shown here, I'm trying to pick a principle that fits other teachings of Jesus throughout the Gospels. I'm not willy-nilly. I try to make it, I'd say, yeah, that seems to fit what he'd agree with. The third principle is, if I can't find a, it doesn't apply to me directly, and there's no principle, the third thing I'm going to say is, that just teaches me about what God might say to them back then. And then I might look also in the early church, how did Paul in the early church, or the second, third century church, what do they do with this kind of concept? Uh, So that's right. I do listen because it's authoritative. I do not think it's all applicable. For example, Leviticus has nothing to do with my life in Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. I do not go to God in relationship through the Levitical code. I don't avoid pork. Um, I don't think that God is honored by my obeying the Levitical code. If that's what he wanted, Jesus would have taught us to do that, but he didn't teach us to do that. So it teaches me that's what God wanted ancient Jews to do. He wanted them to understand what holiness was and how to be God was their king and live like Weird people group people group amongst a bunch of other non-Jews. Great, but they don't do that anymore. Not with me, he doesn't. I said more than you asked probably, but I want to unpack that. That's a or what question comments do you have about that? Anything? Does that make sense what I'm saying? Did I articulate that? Well, okay. So I don't dismiss the rest of it. I pay real close attention. Then I go, okay, but does it and some people will criticize that. Well, a lot of people, everybody has critical. They might say, yeah, David, but um, aren't we more likely to dismiss a moral duty of Jesus because you're going to find a way to not fit that context? Well, sure, we can. Sure, we can. We can. I try not to do that. I try my best, by God's grace and help, to beg for the open-heartedness to say, please, if I am the rich guy, not literally if I am, if this applies to me, Spirit, tell me. I'll give it up. And if I don't want to give it up, change my heart to I do want to give it up. I don't want anything to get in the way. And so, yeah, I mean, I try my best to 
with failure, but oh, okay. So you were told one time if you break one commandment, you break it, broken them all. Yeah. So Paul says that he quotes. Uh, well, he he talks about that in Romans and um, yeah, in Romans, right? When he loses that, except hold on a second. Now I'm second guessing myself. Where is that? I think it is. You have to Google that. Uh, but it does say you break you break it all. Yeah. There the point is. It, it, I think it is Paul Romans. He's talking to fellow Jews. Don't forget, you can't be self righteous. If you've broken one, you've already broken the Torah. You already broken the law. In other words, you can't say you're perfectly righteous if you broke even one law. Most of us have already done that. I agree. I just don't think when he said that it applies to. So keep going for me. What's your what's your there for? Okay. So you're saying, yeah, oh, I gotcha. So you're thinking if you broke one law, you've broken literally every single law. Gotcha. No, I don't think that's true. I don't think even Jews thought that. I don't think they really thought that if you lied one time, it's the same as now you've murdered and now you've stolen. Now you've been adulterous. No, I don't. Yeah, I hear you. But rather you've broken the covenant. You've broken the covenant. No matter. Oh, that's another good point. So you're saying maybe if you broke one, you broke them all because they're all equal. Yeah, I hear this a lot in church too. People, a lot of confusion on this, it seems to me. Uh, the earliest Christians did not treat, because of Jesus, they did not treat all sins as equally egregious. They're equal in that they're all sins. The nature of the thing itself is a violation of God's will. Yes, it is not true that the consequences of those sins are equally the same. They are not the same. A sin is a sin, but the nature of the sin is a sin, but the consequences of sin is not the same. Jews didn't treat it that way, and nor did the Christians. They never have. And that's why they say, for example, and when Johnny says there are some sins that are mortal and some that are not, I mean, he distinguishes between the two. So some calls physical death, some calls spiritual death. Some will just, C.S. Lewis does this in mere Christianity. He says that he thinks the worst sin there is his pride, like this, the worst conceivable one. He thinks the least worst sin is just sexual sin. It's just a sin of the flesh and just do but the worst is pride because it's a spiritual, mental, emotional state of independence from God. And I think I'm better than him and so forth. And that's his view. But in Christianity in general, that's been a pretty similar. And that's why Catholics have the deadly sins, the non deadly sins. Well, that vocabulary of deadly that is more mortal, that comes from the New Testament. I disagree with their list of deadly sins, but the that vocabulary comes from the New Testament. Yeah. I mean, you see the new Jesus himself in Mark 3 when he says, all sins will be forgiven a person, but this one, that is blaspheming the Spirit. He should have said, no, 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 no. Everything, everything you lost, all of it's the same. But now you might say, well, that was hyperbole. Okay, then that's hyperbole. Nevertheless, he enlisted one person, one sin as hyperbole. But he has other sins throughout the text. He says, um, um, I give so some examples. I don't want to get sidetracked. Mark 13, he says that, when the persecution comes, he said, for those that endure to the end will be saved. He means endure the suffering that's going to happen. Well, um, that seems to sound like enduring suffering is at the top of the list, at least in that time period, in that context, maybe. Um, there are times when he says, ah, see, I'll get bogged down. So Jesus himself seems to treat certain sins as more egregious than others, but they're all sins. In my wedding vows, I made wedding vows to Elaine. I did. And someone said, how's it going? How's your wedding vows going? And said, I broke them. I can never say I'm a perfect husband. Can't happen. So you did everything. You broke it. No, I didn't break every vow. And hopefully what I broke wasn't that big a deal. But I know I broke them. So you don't have a perfect marriage? That's correct. I don't have a perfect vow record. And I'm convinced that's what Elaine does. But I, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She's a horrible. <laughs> uh so all that to say, that's, I think, that Christianity is the same thing. So all sins are not equal in their consequences. They're all sins. I think Christians do that to try to fight against the typical non-Christian view. Well, I'm not that bad. And so the response to that is, yeah, you are. And like, well, no, they might not be that bad. The point is, you still sin. Well, I'm not as bad as Hitler. I hope not. That's true. I'm not Jeffrey Dahmer. I hope not. They're great. Wonderful. And th that was wretched what he did. But you still sinned. And that still matters. You're still a criminal. If you've committed a crime, you're a criminal. Some criminals are dangerous than others. That's right. Some are in prison for longer. That's right. But you're still a criminal. 
but we, we get so caught up in comparing and contrasting that it helps us feel self-righteous. We're, we're, it helps us feel exonerated. I'm better than you. Yeah, but you're in prison. But they do that in prison too, right? That's why they kill the pedophiles. That's why they put pedophiles in separate sections, because I'm better than they are. I'm a serial killer. I'm not a pedophile. I've heard porn stars on inter- documentaries. I'm not a, I'm not a stripper. Strippers go, well, I'm not a prostitute. They're very different. Okay. I mean, it's like not about what the field is. Great question. So does Jesus forgive any sin, basically with a murder or a thief, or if they're a thief and whatever, he forgive everything. And the New Testament answer is yes, he forgives everything. That's correct. That's great. So I like how Paul, uh, Jesus says this in Luke's gospel, and the woman's washing his feet with her tears. He says, the one who's been forgiven much loves a whole lot. In other words, you've forgiven a whole lot. Some people aren't forgiven that much, but they're forgiven. They have to repent no matter who they are. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. When I gave my life to Jesus at six, seven years old, I wasn't, I was a sinner, but not a dirty, rotten Hitler. I was a good boy. I was terrified of my mom. And so I was a perfect little boy who followed the rules and with rare exception, my whole life ever rebelled or did anything. But um, yes, I know I sinned, but that, so God, Jesus, I needed forgiveness. I didn't, I wasn't forgiven as much as a Hitler was. I'm glad I was six, (laughs) but I still needed forgiveness. Now I'm catching up to Hitler. I'm a man now, but at the time, at the time it was different. So you're right. So who was forgiven much loves a whole lot. Well, I was forgiven and I, but the older I get, the more it's true. We all, if you're a Christian for a while and you're adult, the older you get, the more you live, the more you really start appreciating the enormous amount of grace that we need. We need. I like how Paul says in Ephesians, is he lavished love on us. Like when I was six or seven, I go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I'm forgiven. But I didn't think I was that bad, but I thought I was bad sometimes. Now I'm an adult. And, oh, I know I need the cross badly. But that doesn't mean he didn't forgive me back then or he only forgives light sins or he only forgives serious sins. No, he forgives. That's not fair. I mean, that's the whole point of Luke 15. The prodigal, right, he comes back. It's the brother who's ticked off. It's not fair. It's not fair. He gets the fatted calf. Look at all the sinning he's been doing. I've been here doing everything I'm supposed to be doing as a dutiful son at home doing everything. It's not fair. It's not fair. That's exactly what apparently certain Jewish leaders, teachers were saying in Jesus' ministry. That's why he told the parable. It's not one of grace. It's to tell the brother. The whole parable's for the brother. It's for the people in the audience who are critical of Jesus' message of grace. It ticks them off to hear these stories about God forgiving that. Why would God do that? That's wretched and horrible. I mean, I might be bad, but I'm not him. That son's a wretch. And he goes, listen, you've had everything. You've always had this. But the son's come home. It's that sense of it's not fair. It's not fair. I had a professor used to say, that's right, grace isn't fair. Mm-hmm. That's right. Mm-hmm. People get mad. So you're telling me that mass killer was on his deathbed. He's like, surrendered his life to Jesus. He'd forgive him. That's not right. Oh, I completely agree it's not right. Ooh, I agree. It's not fair. It's not fair. I completely agree with you. Well, well what? We have a word for something's done that's not fair. It's called grace. I agree. Never too late. It's never too late. That's exactly right. It's never too late. No, it's never too late. No, it's not. There's no New Testament. Jesus never says, well, there comes a time when you get over that hump. No. And God decides whether they really meant it. I mean, you know, I don't. Yeah. Oh, amen, sister. That's gospel. And one of us is so ticked off, the brother, that's not fair. Then we're just like the Pharisee in the parable Jesus tells of two people go to ask God for prayer in the temple. And one says, oh, God, thank you so much for making me not like those dirty Gentiles. And the tax collector goes, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he goes, that one went home justified. The one who was not so busy claiming self-righteous above how other bad people are so much worse than he is, just says, God, please save me. He said, that's the one. Not the one who's worried about comparing, contrasting, who's the sinner. So why wouldn't the brother who went away come back? Why wouldn't he be forgiven? The other brother was at home. He was already at home. Why wouldn't he be forgiven? Because that's not what Jews thought about God. Because in the Old Testament, when you left all through, uh, particularly Leviticus, but when you, when you deliberately, when you knew the Mosaic covenants, 
and you deliberately broke them, there was no forgiveness for you. You're kicked out of the community. That's just like in my marriage. If I knew I'm not supposed to cheat on Elaine, I deliberately cheat on her, you, you divorce. It's over. It's over. So for God to take this person who deliberately knew what he was doing and rebelled, the image of a father running after him in joy is bizarre. A normal Jew is absolutely on the side of the brother. Well, today's application might be, well, depend, yeah, it's any person who knew what they were supposed to do with a relationship with God and rejected it. But if I'm talking to a Christian, that's another issue altogether. Yeah, the story is not applying. The story was not told to Christians. It was told to Jews in the first century. Maybe afterwards we can talk about that if you want. Yeah, that's good. That's good. But some might do. Okay, well, speaking of that, that's coming next. So <laughs> the other kind of ethical system we see in the Bible is consequentialism. Uh, for example, outcome-based, remember? Things like the parable of the so-called Good Samaritan. And uh, Luke 10, the focus is on the outcome of each person's action or inaction. Well, the Samaritan's act leading to the well-being of the injured man. You remember that story, right? He helps a guy. A couple of handouts on the back table if you want a handout. Uh, you remember the end of that parable. It's the only parable in the entire New Testament where Jesus says, go do like he did. If you're King Jimmy, use the King James Version. Go do ye likewise. It's the only parable that says that. The point is, go do that. Learn from this. The consequence of that this guy was was made well again. He went to a hotel, and he was taken care of. Go do that. That The consequence, he overlooked that social animosity that Samaritans and Jews had, and they did. There was hostility for centuries. He overlooked that hostility for the benefit of the Samaritan. That's, that's consequentialist or utilitarian. What about 1 Corinthians 8? Paul discusses the meat offered to idols. Paul suggests that while eating meat is not intrinsically wrong, that'd be deontology, believers should avoid it if it leads to negative consequences for others. 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans uh, uh, 13 or 12, 13, he says, that there, he says uh, therefore, I won't eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes my brother to stumble, that causes my brother to stumble. That's consequentialism. He said, I know in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, we know food offered to idols doesn't mean anything because idols are demons and they're worthless. Who cares? It's just brisket. That's all it is. But to those who think it's a dirty, rotten sin, it's going to ruin their conscience. So don't do that. Think of them. That's consequentialism. And of course, virtue ethics. Uh, well, any question about consequentialism? <laughs> so you shouldn't hang out with sinners, so that's going to cause you to sin? Shouldn't hang out with sinners if I've done this. Thing. Try to help someone. We should try to help someone if we can, depending on the resources and context. But by hang out, if you mean have a relationship with a person who might terribly tempt you to sin, that is correct. I would not do that. That's correct. I could tell you why. Like Galatians 6, when he says, Those who have the Spirit help your brother who is sin, but watch out lest you too fall. Uh, but in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, I didn't tell you to leave. Don't get around people who sin. If that's the case, you got to leave the world. He says, I said, don't hang out with people who claim the name of brother of Christ and sin. You don't form close relationships with people who say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then you know for a fact they don't live like it because they're going to influence you to sin. That's exactly right. It matters who you hang out with all the time. But that doesn't mean you can't help them or serve them or love them. I mean, Jesus was called a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He hung out with sinners, but we don't have evidence that he was close with them. We don't have evidence of that. Now, close can be an ambiguous term. I get it. But did he eat? He did eat with them. Yes, he did. A sign of hospitality and teaching them and preaching to them. That's right. That's right. But being buddies, yeah, I don't I don't have any reason to think Jesus was buddies with non-Jews and non-people who follow the kingdom of God. I don't know of any reason. Nor Paul. I'm sure Paul preached all kinds of people. He had to be around non-Christians all the time. But as far as being buddies, no, his buddies were co-ministers in the faith. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Because he didn't want, I'm sure he didn't want to be constantly tempted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to be real careful. You have to be real careful. I know, I don't know him personally, but I read a book. There's a guy who, he it's called Triple X Church, and he does ministry to porn, porn uh, stars. So he goes to big porn conventions, he and his wife. They set up a tent, like Paul, at these massive porn conventions and gives out Bibles. 
but he puts a wrapping on the Bible where it's called something else. And I saw this documentary. And it, it, so he talks to me, what's this all about? He giving out free goodies. Everything's free goodies, whether it's porn DVDs or naked women everywhere or whatever, guys. And he's giving out these books and different stuff. So they have their bags, walking around bags, all these people at convention. And then a, the camera pans over to the trash can and it's full of their books. Once they realize, they open up, realize what it is, they just dump them right there. Not all of them, but then it showed people who are, they, then they also have people who came out of the industry. They take them to hotel rooms at that, where this convention is, and they share the gospel with them. They say, we want to offer a way out of this. And some are like, I don't want it. I love this. And I was like, the drug, all that to say, um, so they had to be real careful. He wants to minister. He felt called years ago, and they've done enormously good work. You talk about being careful. That's why he has his wife there and other stuff. Like, he doesn't, you know, you got to be around him. But you got to be careful. Well, that's why I don't hang out with Brandon Simpson ever. I mean, I just, I don't want to go down. You can tell him I said that. Just kidding. I love him. Virtue ethics. So that's also in the Bible. Fruit of the Spirit. I said uh, fruits. That's that's wrong type of. It's singular in the the Greek. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit. There it goes. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so not blah, but that's good. So those are virtues. Some would say those are character based. I would too. This is part of who, if the Spirit's working in you, you'll know it because these things come out of you. Fruit of the Spirit, corpus, uh, it's probably a, a corporate, what we call a collective noun, like team is a collective noun. So it probably means the fruit. That is to say, it's like he's picturing fruit on the vine. He's got a thing in his hand. But he's looking at this. This is the kind of fruit that spirit tree grows. So it's probably, but I'm just, you know me a little bit, Julian, I'm a nerd. So it is not fruits of the spirit. That's not what Paul said. He's, I, I, the translation here is correct, but the fruit of the spirit, not the fruits of the spirit. All right, it's not a, that's right. Not a bunch of little trees, but one tree. That's right. A bounty of fruit. Amen, sister. Uh, wisdom literature. You see all this like the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, often wisdom, righteousness, integrity. You could go to that for virtue. And of course, things like 1 Corinthians 13, the virtue of love, things like that. Um, so we see that. I'm going to wrap up on this next part because I want to slow on this next part. I'm going to slow down. Can I go to the top page five? Okay. So the, just a few minutes. And then also we talked about divine command theory a long time ago. Do you remember that conversation about whether it's good because? Uh, so is it good because God wills it or is it good just because it is? And I, my view is essentialism, that it's essentially in God's character. So if something is good because it's in God's character, we have the moral duty because he commands it. So like Abraham and Isaac or Yisak in Genesis 22, God tests Abraham's obedience by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac. So we'd say in that instance, that one time, it was good because God said to do it. And I'm going to come about that later on. Um, Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me and as will, but you will. So that's an idea of an instance where God, God the Father commanded him to do something. It doesn't mean God commands Jennifer to go to the cross for other people's sin. Right? This is a unique time where it's a unique special episode in history where God will send, the Father will send Jesus. Biblical authors, back to your question a little bit ago about this, uh, biblical authors can switch their own ethical system when they choose in the same text. And I didn't do this in Ephesians. We're not there yet. I probably Ephesians 5, 3 to 4 it is virtue ethics. 5 to 6 is consequentialism. 7 to 9 is virtue. 10 is deontology. Paul doesn't call it that. My point is, if you look these up, you'll see Paul himself in the same few verses changes this, what we call ethical system. So back to you asking, I was saying, I have a reason why I don't pick one because the New Testament doesn't pick one. And all three are biblical. All three are biblical. And I'll come back, you can read yourself, but we're out of time there. I think all three are biblical. My own view is that Christians ought to put them in order of significance. And my view is typically virtue ethics and then deontology and then consequentialism. But I kind of, virtue and deontology, me, I switch between the two. I'm going to come back next time and I'm going to ask you, what do you do? And then we're going to wrap up. So next week will be our last pastor study, okay? I'm going to ask you what you do. Not in judgment. I'm going to say, which one do you find most persuasive? And how do you order them? And we'll go from there. Any questions about that?